About 200 years ago, there was a phrase that was first coined, may you live in interesting times. For astronomers and physicists, that is especially true today because the James Webb Space Telescope works and it works perfectly. <laughs> I'm Mike Davis, Deputy Mission Systems Engineer for the Webb Telescope Project out of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. This evening, I'm going to talk to you about the Webb Telescope Project. I'm going to tell you about why it is, what it is, but more interesting and probably the reason you're here, what is it doing? We're gonna look at the images that the web has beamed to the ground over the past few months. Some is only as recent about two weeks ago. Where Dr. Carter had to keep changing the package because it says, got another picture to show. Got another picture to show. Finally, I know, the email last week, it says, I've gotta be done tinkering. Sure enough, there was another picture Friday that I was tempted to include, but I didn't. Tonight, we're gonna to use those images to go on a journey. I'm going to explain what it is about these images that I show that makes it interesting. It makes scientists so giddy. We're gonna go on a journey using these images from the neighboring planets in our solar system to the farthest reaches of the universe. But of course, every journey begins with a single step. And in this case, the first step is the Hubble Space Telescope in orbit around the Earth since 1990. Through the course of five servicing missions, the last of which was in 2009, we had 11 different science instruments accommodated and numerous electronics boxes, computers, solar arrays, gyros, data recorders. The first data recorder on the Hubble telescope in 1990 was a reel-to-reel -reel tape deck. <laughs> now it's a solid state recorder. The Hubble telescope operated in the visible wavelengths and was used as a survey instrument. It looked at stars, it looked at galaxies, it looked at planets. And as it works with any big project that is up in orbit for a few years, immediately attitudes and concern turns to what's next? What is the next thing that we're going to do? 1996, there was a panel report, HST and beyond, recommended that the next telescope be a large infrared telescope, at that time known as the Next Generation Space Telescope, to be the follow-on to Hubble. NGST at that time, was subsequently named James Webb Space Telescope in honor of NASA Administrator James Webb, who ran NASA during the Apollo missions in the late 60s. In the year 2000, the National Academy of Sciences in their decadal survey, every 10 years it comes out, it serves as a roadmap for NASA, what are they going to do next, gave their highest endorsement to the James Webb Space Telescope at that time scheduled for a 2010 launch. We missed it just by a little bit, but that's okay, because it works, and it works perfectly. And as you'll see, these are truly interesting times, because you're gonna see some of the images today that are causing scientists to start scratching their chins, saying, you know, we're gonna to have to rewrite the textbooks. Hubble caused us to rewrite several of them. Webb is gonna cause us to rewrite all of them. So the first thing that the Webb Telescope was sold on was the four major science themes. The first was first light, reionization. It was the intent of the Webb Telescope to explore when stars first formed after the Big Bang, roughly 300 to 400 million years after the Big Bang, as well as looking at when galaxies first evolved, roughly 400 to 500 million years after the Big Bang. In addition, Webb Telescope would look at the birth of stars and protoplanetary systems, as well as the formation of galaxies and other worlds, not just the planets in our solar system, but planets around other stars as well. The reason why the JWST science themes require an infrared telescope are tried to be depicted on this chart. 
When you're looking at distant galaxies that formed 500 million years after the Big Bang, they were formed as a result of the expansion of the universe. And as the universe expanded, the light from these galaxies was shifted from the visible wavelengths into the infrared wavelengths. You couldn't see them in the visible because it's called a Doppler shift. If you're not familiar with the Doppler shift, the simplistic example is you stand on a train platform and a train comes whizzing by blowing the whistle. What does the whistle do as it passes you? It changes pitch. That's a Doppler shift. Light exhibits the same type of characteristics. If it's far away and it's receding, expanding away from you, it's shifted into the red part of the spectrum. That's a Doppler shift. So the light from these distant galaxies is redshifted from visible wavelengths to near infrared wavelengths of approximately five microns. In addition, the Webb telescope also must operate in the mid-infrared from five to 28 microns. Because if you're looking at stars that are undergoing formation, they're surrounded by dust. It's a curtain that obscures your view of the stars that are forming. What happens then is that you want to be able to look through that dust, and the only way to do that, to lift that curtain, is to observe in the infrared between five and 28 microns where you can actually penetrate the dust and see into these dusty cocoons to see the stars that are forming. On the left, M16, taken by Hubble, viewed invisible light shows the dusty pillars in, in cocoons. On the right is the same object viewed by the Spitzer Space Telescope, and you can see that observing in infrared, you can see into the cocoons, and you can see the objects hidden by the dust. So that was the science themes. What was Webb designed to do? Why an infrared telescope? But that's not all that you need to go out and design a telescope. You need, they call them requirements. Dr. Carter mentioned 30,000 requirements. The overarching requirement for the Webb telescope is, let's see if the laser pointer works. Oh, it does, barely. That's low signal. Anyways, the key requirement is to detect an 11 nanojansky point source at a high signal to noise ratio. Nanojansky is just, it's a unit of flux, it's a unit of intensity. Now, in colloquial terms, or trying to make it easier for you to grasp what 11 nanojanskys is, is that if you take your five watt nightlight that you may have at home in your bathroom or your bedroom if you're scared at night of ghosts or whatever like that, and you take this nightlight and you put it on the moon and you look at it from Earth, its flux is 20 nanojanskys. It's a five watt nightlight visible at the moon is 20 nanojanskys and Webb is looking at something half as bright as that. That is basically the Webb performance requirement in a nutshell. You want high signal because you don't want to be standing there for hours and hours and hours counting individual photons. You've got other stuff to do. There's plenty of other objects to look at. So for high signal, you make a big mirror. Of course, there's no rockets that exist with a large payload fairing to accommodate a 20, 20 foot wide mirror. So you make it in segments, that way you unfold it on orbit. In addition, you want low noise. The way you do this in infrared is that you cool the telescope. You cool the telescope, you also cool the detectors. The easiest way to cool the telescope is to throw it out a long way from Earth. You don't want it near Earth. Earth throws out too much heat. Plus, it goes from the night side to the dark side. You lose observing time. So what you do is you put it what they call the Lagrange point. There's five of them. We pick L2, which is about 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth, opposite the sun. And there you use a large deployable sunshield sun to cool the telescope. At that point, the sunshield, shown here, size of a tennis court, it has an incident flux of sun of 200,000 watts, but the sunshield is so good of that 200,000 watts incident upon it, all but 0 0.02 watts is reflected and absorbed by the sunshield. In SPF terms for those sun worshipers at the beach, 
It's approximately an SPF of 1 million. So now you use the sun shield to passively cool the telescope, the mirrors, and then you use the detectors, which are cooled by dedicated radiators, which dump their excess heat to deep space. And in addition, there's a mid infrared detector that uses an active cryocooler to cool the detector assembly of this one instrument called MIRI, you'll see a picture of it in a little bit, down to about six and a half Kelvin. That's only about 300, that's actually about 450 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. That's how cool that detector has to be. In addition, the Webb telescope has to sense objects as small as 0.084 arc seconds. That doesn't mean anything until you realize that that value is the angle subtended by a penny at a distance of 30 miles. In addition to resolving an object as fine as that, the telescope has to be stable. It does you no good to be collecting photons if the telescope is wandering all over the sky. So for Webb, the requirement is a pointing stability of 0.007 arc seconds. Not because the fan of the requirement was a fan of James Bond. No, that's just the requirement that it is. And 0.007 arc seconds is that if you put the JWST at the US Capitol, 0.007 arc second stability would keep a laser beam pointed on a penny atop the Empire State Building in New York City. That's how stable the Webb telescope is. That was the stability requirement, 0.007. Now remember, I said it works, it works perfectly. You wanna know how well Webb works, how stable the Webb telescope is? 0.007, that's the requirement. Our performance to date, stability, 0.0012, a factor of six better than the requirement. So I'm not exaggerating when I say it works perfectly. Oops, there we go. Here are the four instruments for the Webb telescope mounted inside the science instrument integrating structure. It's called the ISOM, Integrated Science Instrument Module. Starting at the top, you barely see it, but blustered inside the other instruments in the wiring. It's the fine guidance sensor, which provides near-infrared imagery, as well as spectroscopy. Imagery is pretty self-explanatory. It takes pictures. Spectroscopy, it's a spectrograph. It can break down light into its component wavelengths, and based on that, you can tell what the light is emitted from. You can identify elements. You can identify molecules. And you'll see you use that as a handy tool to tease out the details of what components and molecules are in atmospheres of other planets. On the right, the near-infrared spectrometer, which is a multi-object spectrometer that can take spectra of 100 different objects simultaneously. In the back here in the bottom, NIRCAM, the Near Infrared Camera, the workhorse, JWST, wide field images. If there's pretty pictures, more likely than not, they came from NIRCAM. And then tucked away here in the far left, MIRI, mid-infrared imager, also has high-resolution spectroscopy. This is the instrument with the focal plane cooled by the cryocooler that gives us the ability to observe out to 28 microns. Here is an overview of the elements of the Webb telescope itself. First of all, to give you an idea of the size, 22 by 14 by 10 meters doesn't mean much. It's basically a school bus stuck pointing up, mounted inside a tennis court. Weight, about 13,000 pounds, uses a 2,000 watt solar array for power. Data recorder, we don't use tape recorders anymore. It's a solid state data recorder with 471 gigabit capacity. Data link, we don't have Wi-Fi in space. It's very slow, it's 28 megabytes per second. That's, you know, what your cable provider at home is what, 100, 200, 400 megabytes per second. We're 28, and that's fast for us. 10 year on orbit life. Of course, it has to be stowed, folded up like a piece of origami to fit inside the rocket. 
deployed, size of a tennis court, and a school bus sticking out of the middle of it. Let's look at the pieces. In yellow, the optical system of the telescope, called the optical telescope element. Light comes from the far right, off stage, reflects off the primary mirror, off the secondary mirror, which is these trusses here, support the secondary mirror, and then reflects the light back into the optic subsystem where it picks up the light for, to the science instruments. Science instruments are shown here in the blue cutaway. Got the isom mounted in the back of the mirror. And then the isom electronics compartment, which is mounted below the telescope assembly. Because remember I said you want to keep everything you know, cool. Electronics generate a lot of heat. So what we do is we separate the electronics from the mechanisms themselves as much as possible. After that, we have the sun shield, five layers to provide thermal shielding to allow OT and isom to passively cool. In addition, we have this windmill-like called a trim tab. This thing is like the size of, a tel uh, size of a tennis court. The force of photons emitted by the sun would actually turn the telescope over time, much like that of a windmill. So you do a trim tab that actually keeps the telescope stable, otherwise the thing would would windmill constantly. You don't want that because you want to keep your you want to keep your laser pointed at the penny atop the Empire State Building. And then the spacecraft, which contains your communications and your reaction wheels to keep the spacecraft steady and that that 471 gigabyte data recorder and everything, and then the solar array that provides power. The sun shield keeps the warm sides warm because the spacecraft loves to operate at ambient conditions keeps the cool stuff cool because the telescope wants to operate at cold conditions. How big is this telescope? School bus inside of a tennis court doesn't mean anything. This is a full-size mock-up of the telescope. It was constructed by Northrop Grumman back in the mid-2000s. It's been around, I believe, a rough calculation would show that it's been to so many places that if you strung one in front of the other, it's probably been to the moon. Not quite to L2, but almost to the moon. This was at Goddard in 2008. Bonus sticker, if anybody can find me in there. <laughs> Lindsay? No? <laughs> My own daughter can't find me. There I am. The pink shirt with the cool shades. <laughs> that was in 2008, and I had already been working on the program for, for over five years by then. A lot of you, if you're sophomores, freshmen, you weren't even born yet, and I was working on this telescope. Think about that. It shows you how old I am. JWST comes together. I'm only going to dwell here in the final five years or so of the telescope itself. In 2016, in the large clean room at Goddard, the telescope was bolted together to the instrument science instrument module. In 2017, after assembly and testing at Goddard, the telescope was flown to Johnson Space Center and put it in a large cryo vacuum chamber to give you an end-to-end -end test of the optical system of the telescope. The test that Hubble never did. If Hubble had done it, they would have detected the flaw in the Hubble mirror. That's why we did this test, to detect the flaw and make sure everything works. Don't forget, we can't service this telescope. It's out a million and a half kilometers away. So we put it in this large chamber. It had existed at Johnson in the 60s. The astronauts used it for practicing moonwalks. Before we used it and after Apollo, it was used for movies. They actually filmed Transformers there. Armageddon was there. Optimus Prime had a big decal on the door of the chamber for a while. 2018, after the testing of Johnson, the telescope was flown to Northrop Grumman in Space Park, California, Redondo Beach, for observatory integration where the telescope and the ISOM was mated to the sun shield and the spacecraft and underwent couple of years of deployment testing. In September of 2021, the whole observatory was packaged into this large canister and left LA, transported down 105 to Long Beach, put on a boat, 
sail down the Mexican coast, weekend at Mazatlan, through the Panama Canal, over through Caribbean and down the northeastern coast of South America, where in October 21, three weeks later, it arrived in French Guiana, where it was launched by the Europeans. Why the Europeans? First of all, it's an international mission, so they provided the rocket. Saved NASA $350 million in itself. That's how much a rocket launch cost to toss something that's big into orbit. The other thing, too, is, is that this launch site is at the equator which makes it a lot easier to launch payloads out to L2 because you don't have to do what they call a plane change. The rocket can spend all of its energy just transporting everything out to where you want to go. What did I do Christmas morning? I was on console, 7.20 in the morning, we launched. Merry Christmas, best Christmas ever. <laughs> 7.45 in the morning, we separated, we were power positive. The solar array was the first thing that needed to deploy. You get past that, you know you've got power, so you've got the ability to handle everything else that may be thrown at you. And then for the next roughly 180 days, we did an on-orbit checkout. We checked out the spacecraft for the 30 days. You gotta deploy the sun shield, you gotta deploy uh, the, the radiators, you gotta deploy the communications antenna. There were 344 single point failures that if any one of them had occurred, we would have lost the mission within the first 30 days. All of them worked perfectly. <laughs> Telescope, commissioning through April of 22. So it took about 90 days, 110 days actually. While the instruments were cooling down, the telescope was actually undergoing its checkout. And then the instruments, once the telescope was checked out and we could focus the stars, the instruments continued their commission activities through July of 22. How do you align a telescope? You got an 18 segment hexagonal telescope. So you got 18 one meter mirrors, each of them focusing as their own individual telescope. So the first thing you do is that after launch, don't forget when, when we launched all the mirrors, they, they can move in seven degrees of freedom. So they can move back and forth, up and down, back side to side. So we actually ratcheted them into what we call a snubber that fastened the mirrors and kept them from shaking during the turbulence encounter during ascent. So after that, what we did is we moved the mirrors forward and started taking pictures. And the top picture shows you what you start to get. You, st you get 18 different images, one, Looking at a single star, you get 18 different images of that single star, one per mirror. So the first thing you do is that you want to identify which mirror is generating which star. So what you do is you drive each individual mirror, ratchet it forward and backward, and seeing which of those 18 images move. That way you can map the image to the individual stars. Here's the wing. Here's another wing, and the rest are in the center 12 hexagonal sections of the mirror. Once you know that, and you know if I move this mirror in this direction, you can do that for all the other mirrors, and you drive them such that they're centered on each of the hexagonal panels of the primary mirror. So that's what you got here, the image array. The next thing you do is that you drive them all to a single common focus. So you no longer have 18 different images, you've got a single image. And once we did that, that's when we realized we were onto something. This is just an initial alignment image, and you can see already galaxies. If you look through Hubble, and this is the reason why we chose this star, and it was in the constellation Ursa Major, because Hubble showed it to be an empty field. There was nothing there. But as we have learned with Webb, Wherever you look, you see something. There is always something to look at. And this is just an example. So, enough of the why it is, what it is. Let's look at how it is. Let's begin our journey. Let's go from the solar system to distant galaxies. Jupiter, viewed by NIRCAM. This one image sums up the entire science capability of the JWST Jupiter System Program. The 
and study the dynamics and chemistry of Jupiter itself. If you're looking at the clouds, darker regions is the light reflected from deeper clouds. High altitude clouds are brighter because they're illuminated by the sun. There's aurora on, that, on Jupiter, much like there is on Earth. South Pole, North Pole. You can see the ring of Jupiter. A couple of its satellites here. Jupiter is 80 satellites. Four of them were discovered by Galileo back in the late 1600s. This is a view of Hubble of Jupiter, uh, traditional what you see. This is how it looks viewed through a telescope. It's always different when you're looking at infrared. It's a totally different uh, perspective of the universe. But this is Jupiter as viewed by NIRCAM. Neptune, viewed by Hubble. It's a pretty featureless blue disk formed by uh, methane gas of Neptune's atmosphere. And the reason it looks so different as taken by NIRCAM is that methane gas absorbs infrared light except for the high altitude clouds. So in infrared imagery, you not only can see these clouds, but you can also see how clear the rings are. You can't see the rings in visible light through, through the observation of Hubble but you can see it very clearly in infrared. This bright object here, this is Jupiter, uh, Jupiter. This is Neptune's brightest moon, Triton. And the reason why it appears actually as bright, if not brighter than Nep uh, Neptune itself, is because its surface is covered with a, a layer of condensed nitrogen that reflects greater than 70% of the incident light. So that's why it appears just as bright, if not brighter, than, than Neptune itself. And then in the background here on the sides, you can see some of Neptune's other moons as well. I believe there's like 14 moons of Neptune, if I'm correct. Now, we haven't looked at Saturn yet. Saturn's not in a good place for the sky for us to view it quite yet. We can't look at Venus and we cannot look at Mercury because they're too close to the sun and you want to keep the telescope cold. So we'll never be able, if we're looking at Venus, we're not working perfectly anymore, folks. We're done, we're toast. Okay, uh, we haven't looked at Uranus yet, although we have spent quite a lot of time in the past week looking at Pluto. So those observations should be coming out in, probably in the next couple of weeks. Now let's move beyond our solar system. 1,150 light years away, a light year is the distance light travels in a year, it's approximately six trillion miles. This is the exoplanet WASP-96b, so what you have is a planet in orbit around another star, 1,150 light years away. This planet is the size, well, about similar to Jupiter, and it orbits the star at a distance of about five million miles in three days. So it's really close to its planet, or close to its star. And that's why it has a surface temperature on the order of 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now what we can do with our spectroscopy of the Webb telescope is that as the planet passes in front of, alongside, and behind the star, we can compare the starlight to when it's filtered through the planet's atmosphere as the planet moves in front of it to the starlight that it's unfiltered when the planet is either on either side of the star or it's behind the star. And when you compare the two, you can literally subtract one from the other and the difference gives you a feel for the spectroscopy of the planetary atmosphere itself. So when we did that, and this was one of the first five images released by NASA for Webb Telescope back July 12th, you start to see here the wavelength is a function of um, from 0 0.75 to 2.75 microns. You can see the dips and the rises and everything like that. The location of the peaks gives you the type of molecules. So you've got water, 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 carbon dioxide, and a couple of other incidences. The height of the peaks is directly proportional to the temperature, and the shape of the peaks allows you to deduce the presence of clouds and haze. So just by looking at these little squiggly lines, you can tell what the atmosphere of this other planet is, is made of and how, how thick it is and whether there's clouds or haze in the atmosphere and how hot it is as well.
Carina Nebula, Stellar Nursery. Stars are forming here. Dr. Green's wearing this picture on his new bow tie, so take a look. <laughs> it appears opaque at visual wavelengths. Look at the Hubble telescope image at the top. Look at the Webb telescope image at the bottom. Opaque, the curtain of dust at the top. We can see right through it. The infrared capabilities of the Webb telescope allow us to penetrate and see into these dusty regions. So you're looking at stellar nurseries where stars are forming, and in some cases, perhaps, where planets will eventually form. Now, we're going to take a slight detour with this next chart, but it's pretty interesting because a lot of people are under the impression that when images are sent down to the ground, there are those pretty pictures like that. Nah, that's not the case. Also, keep in mind these stars here, see the reflection, you see these spikes here, there's, there's eight of them in an image. Okay, you'll see that in the next chart. Top left, these are what images look like from a web telescope when they're first sent to the ground. They're black and white. We have filters that we move in front of each of the basically the eyepieces of the instrument. So you can look at a filter, change the filter, look at another wavelength, change the filter, look at a third wavelength. Each picture is transmitted to the ground in black and white. Rain, color range of zero black to 256 pure white. So that way when it happens is that there's somebody at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore whose job it is is to take these pictures and combine them. So he starts with images one and three, individual exposures using three different filters. And then he'll assign color values. Depends upon how creative. You're not going to get periwinkle and stuff like that. So you usually get something that approximates the color that you might expect to see. So you start assigning, and then you combine the images. So that's what you see in image four. If you adjust the image parameters, you start getting something like five, six, and seven. So now you're starting to see color, and you're starting to see structure. Eight is your final composition, and nine is final color and contrast adjustments. And those are the pictures that are posted on the NASA website and shown on the front page of the Washington Post or the New York Times. That's what you see. You know, people wouldn't get enthusiastic with these black, black and white pictures. That's like the pictures that Mariner took of the surface of Mars in 1964. I mean, we're way beyond that. But that's basically how web, web, web transmits to the ground. Not the pretty color, it's black and white. In addition, why do the bright stars have spikes? It's two things. The first of all is that the mirror array itself is hexagonal. So the primary mirror itself gives rise to six spikes. And then you have the secondary mirror, which is that tripod that sticks out of the primary mirror. And there's three struts. Each of those struts generates two more diffraction images, two more spikes. So six plus six, 12. But why do we see eight? Because what we did is we, we designed the telescope, we positioned the secondary mirror support structure, that tripod, such that it would overlay four of the spikes formed by the primary mirror. So that's why you only see eight and you don't see 12. Just some clever designing there. So now you've seen what it looks like when it's transmitted to the ground and why, why they have spikes. Let's continue our journey. Southern Ring Nebula, NGC 3132. It's a planetary nebula. It's formed as a star is dying. It's exploded. This is its remnant. 2,500 light years away. It's a shell of dust and gas ejected from a dying star. When we looked at it in Miri, remember I said it, the advantage of looking at long words of five microns, so Miri, you're looking at 20 microns, 25 microns, is that you can penetrate dust. You can only see one star here. Miri sees two. The fainter star is wrapped in dust and is the actual dying star itself, the star that blew up. That's its carcass right there, the small one to the left of the bright one. Viewed face on, I mean, it looks strange, but here we're looking at it's viewed face on, so it's like looking at my hand. If rotated to edge on, it would actually look like two bowls placed together at the bottom with a large hole in the center. So that's basically what it looks like, and it's just coincidence that it's face on to us. In addition, you can see a spike here 
in infrared here, and the near cam is actually an edge-on galaxy. Remember I said, no matter where you point, you're going to see stuff. Photobomb of a spiral galaxy, edge-on, that nobody had ever seen before. And here it's plain as day. M74, a spiral galaxy in the constellation Pisces, 32 million light years away. When you look at it in the Hubble in the optical wavelengths at the far left, well, it looks pretty. It's a spiral, pinwheel, a lot of dust. Can't see much else. Hubble and Webb together give you a better view. You can start seeing some brighter regions in the arms here, which are actually where stars are being formed. And if you look in deeper into the infrared, Forget the dust, you're looking through now where regions of stars are being formed and then the blue is a large cluster of stars that nobody had ever seen at the center of this galaxy itself. That shows you in one picture the difference of what it is to be able to look at something, not in the optical region, but in the infrared region, to be able to penetrate the dust, to see stuff that hasn't been seen before. Stefan's Quintet. There's five galaxies in this picture. One, two, three, four, five. The leftmost galaxy, forget about it. It's a foreground object. It's actually one, four objects behind, one object in front. So the leftmost galaxy is 40 million light years away. The other four are 290 million light years away that are merging and interacting and allow us to see how star formation is triggered. The topmost galaxy here as a supernova massive black hole, 24 million times the mass of the sun at its center. And that's why Muse wrote the song Supermassive Black Hole. It's for that galaxy itself. In addition, if you looked at the full image, this is cropped, there's a thousand galaxies just in the background itself. No matter where you see, where you point the telescope, you're able to see stuff. What's next? SMAX 0723. This is a deep field image. This was actually released by President Biden on July 11th. What you're looking at is an example of what they call gravitational lensing. Gravitational lensing occurs when you have a galaxy or a massive foreground object, and behind it you have a distant object and the distant object has its light distorted and bent by this foreground cluster. And sometimes it's one object and sometimes it appears as two objects. But what happens is that you get these distorted pictures of the background galaxy that you can't otherwise see. And they're actually mirrored on either side of the center of the galaxy. Now to give you an example of how well the Webb telescope works and how sensitive it this is that 11 nanojansky point source type of thing. Hubble stared at this field for 15 days, 24 hours a day, and that's what it got. This was done in 12 hours, 1 30th of the time, and that's what we got. And we're going to go deeper than that. We're going to be looking at objects like this for 15 days. Imagine what those will look like. Now, just as recently as last week, there was a study done of this imager, and it showed that this arc here, if you blow it up, you can actually see the evidence for a globular cluster around that part of the galaxy that's imaged like that. A globular cluster usually forms outside the plane of the galaxy itself. The near cluster is 4 billion light years away. The distorted arcs of the lens cluster in the back are up to 13.1 light years distance. So that's only 600 million years after the Big Bang that these arcs themselves of the background object formed. Now we're going to look at, uh, for lack of a better term, potpourri of other objects, a sampling of the near and far. At the top is star formation region in the Tarantula Nebula 30 Doratus. 159,000 light years. This is what happens when you take pictures at various wavelengths. At 1.87 microns, you're able to look at atomic hydrogen. 
at 2.12 microns, you're able to look at molecular hydrogen and hydrocarbon dust, you can image at 3.3 microns, and you put them all together, and this is what you get. But if you take them apart separately, you can start to piecemeal where the regions form in relation to the galaxy itself. So observing while using the different filters brings out the different features of the nebula. It's one of the many quivers in our arrow case, one of the many tools that we have in our toolbox. Remember the previous image of SMAX 0723, you saw the distorted objects. If you have a background object that is located precisely behind the foreground object, you get this, an Einsteinian ring. So you have a near you have a near term galaxy, a near field galaxy right there, the blue center dot. And then this ring is another galaxy directly behind this one. So you have two galaxies. The foreground galaxy is three billion light years away, and it lenses the distant galaxy into a circle, the distant galaxy being at a distance of 12 billion light years away. But this is one of the few examples that exist of the objects actually being superimposed one directly behind the other, and that's why you get that perfect ring. Potpourri of other objects. Remember I said earlier on in the talk this evening about the need to rewrite textbooks in interesting times. And this little red guy here is case in point number one, glass Z13, it's a catalog designator of galaxies. Preliminary studies indicate that this galaxy formed 300 million years after the Big Bang. Why is that a problem? If you remember earlier on, I told about first light, one of the science themes of the Webb telescope is the fact that the first light proved that uh, models and, and observations showed that the first stars formed 300 to 400 million light years after the Big Bang, and the first galaxies formed 400 to 500 million years after the Big Bang. And yet here we have a galaxy that appears to have formed at the time that the first stars were predicted to have been forming. That's a problem. That's a problem. It's an exciting problem. It's an interesting times problem because we're going to keep the publishing companies busy because we're going to have to rewrite the textbooks to explain this. Let's turn our attention down here to the lower left. What you're looking here is a direct image of another planet orbiting a star 385 light years distant. So you're not looking at a star orbiting, uh, a planet orbiting a star that you can't see because it's so close. Here you're actually able to see the planet. Now the reason why we have this little star icon here is that what we use is we have a, a, a little mass that we call a coronagraph on one of the pieces of the science instrument. So we can precisely point the telescope such that the coronagraph is superimposed over the host star, effectively blocking its light. If you can't see the light of the star, what you are able then to do is see the light from objects around the star. Ergo, the planet around HIP 65426. Here's the Orion Nebula. Pretty common object if you've been with Dr. Carter in the fall or at the winter or the spring nights when she's got the Celestron telescopes on the quad. Uh, you might be pointing at the Orion Nebula. It's an Orion sword. It's easy to see. It's also the birthplace of a lot of stars. Clockwise from the upper right is a young star with a disk inside its cocoon. Filaments of hydrocarbon molecules, which are the building blocks of stars and planets. And the Theta Orionis A, the nebula is actually powered. There's four stars, Theta Orionis A through D. This is A as part of the power source of the nebula. And then in the top left is a young star inside a globule of the dust. So you got a star forming and the, the dust is around outside of it. Remember the DART mission a couple weeks ago? Johns Hopkins launched a a probe that rammed into a comet, Dimorphos, or not a comet, an asteroid, Dimorphos, in an effort to, uh, is the movie Armageddon real? Can you actually destroy an asteroid or redirect it from Earth? We actually looked at it with the Webb telescope. Looked at it with Hubble as well. 
we can support other missions just like this. We weren't originally designed to, but we can. And DART, it's depicted here in the top left. You got the spacecraft approaching, you got the large host object, Didymos, and then Dimorphos, which is a very small uh, satellite of Didymos itself. DART impacted Dimorphos, and by looking at the, the change in the momentum imparted by uh, DART upon impact with Dimorphos, you might see the orbital period change of, of Dimorphos with respect to its original orbit. We don't know if that has actually successfully been determined yet. It's gonna take about another month or so for all the readings to be captured and everything like that. However, we do have pictures. Here's a picture just before impact of Emos and Dimorphos from the DART telescope itself. This is the last full frame before the impact. So you're about uh, four miles or so above Dimorphos itself before impact. It also had a, a piggyback satellite called Lisha. And this is the view of the impact when DART impacted Didymos, or Dimorphos, I'm sorry, as viewed by Hubble and also as viewed by JWST. We never thought we'd be able to do this. It's just one of those things that's another tool handy, handy to have in our pocket. Now, you all know that the first images, they were couldn't get away from them. They were all over the place. Frankly, they were a media sensation. There were 6,000 newspaper articles, 125 front page news stories, 1,500 different TV outlet clips, 177 live interviews, trended number one on Twitter for a little while. Then Kim Kardashian reclaimed it with another outfit. New York lit up the Empire State Building in gold in honor of the gold telescope mirrors. We coated them with gold because gold is highly reflective, especially in the infrared region of the spectrum. We didn't put a lot of gold. It's uh, only a couple of ounces of gold on the mirror itself. It's just a few atoms thick. Nova on PBS, they actually did a whole episode on, tel on web called the Ultimate Space Telescope. The uh, first images were shown on the billboards at Times Square and the billboards at Piccadilly Circus in London. How well does JWST work? The orbit injection accuracy provided by ESA, in other words, they put us into such a precise location to where we wanted to be that we don't have to use our propulsion system as often as we thought we would, which means that our 10 years of propellant will last now at least 20 years, and there are some calculations that show that we could last perhaps as long as 25 to 27 years. Pointing stability, I mentioned this earlier, the requirement was 007, but we're actually seeing a stabilization of 0 0.0012 arc seconds per second. We're required to take data 70% of the time. Right now, we're taking data about 83.5% of the time to date. Hubble observing efficiency is only in the order of 55%. One of those reasons is because it's orbiting Earth, so Earth blocks the sky 50% of the time for Hubble. So 55 is about as good as Hubble can do. The other thing that we have is an operational flexibility. We knew that putting a six meter light bucket without a shroud around it, you're gonna get hit by micrometeoroids, and we expected an impact rate of about one per month. However, since each mirror can move in seven degrees of freedom, every time we take a mirror hit, we can actually adjust the focus and compensate. In addition, we're also in the process of adjusting the science program such that we're not observing in the direction most meteors originate. You can tell by the time of year what direction most meteors are going to originate from, so you can skew your observing program and look in a different direction. So we're able to do that. And there's just a couple of pictures of Webb shortly after deployment. This is just after deployment, and then ESA was able to keep the cameras on us so we could see the solar array deploy. So that's Webb. Now, if you remember earlier on the chart when I showed Hubble the first step in the journey, one of the things I pointed out was, well, after it gets up there and it works, people start thinking, well, what's next? What are we gonna do next? What's the next big thing? Here we go. What comes after JWST? First off, 
The Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, well under development at 2027 launch date. It's a wide field infrared survey telescope. So as we were looking through a soda straw at objects and studying single objects in detail, uh, RST, Roman Space Telescope, it's just called RST, why we call JWST, uh, it takes infrared surveys. So it takes big field pictures. But the big brother of the Webb telescope is an infrared optical ultraviolet telescope using an 8 to 15 meter diameter segmented mirror with an emphasis on exoplanets and a launch date of 2045, which at the rate NASA does stuff would be 2065. So you people who are freshmen or sophomores here, you'll be senior citizens ready to retire before this thing flies. However, if it does fly and it does work and it has to work perfectly, when it looks at other planets, it will actually see landforms and clouds and everything like that. So that's the promise of the future. So I think tonight what we've done is we've shown you for Webb what it is, why it is, how well it's working, and yes, it works perfectly, and yes, scientists and physicists are going to have to rewrite their textbooks, but that's okay, because we really do live in interesting times. And with that, thank you. I guess Dr. Carter will allow the laggards that want to leave to leave and those that want to stick around to stick around and ask questions. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Any questions? We have mics here and over there for you to use. So you talked about the unknown space, right? How, how do you decide someday where to look into the unknown? for the first time? Well, we actually have an observing program that's put out, and each year they solicit observations at the Space Telescope Science Institute that controls the telescope. So they put together a set of observing proposals, and they map out a year's worth of observations. And there's always pieces of time that are left unblocked unscheduled, such that if something shows something interesting, we have the ability to go back and redo the observations in a bit more detail. Now, I've shown that wherever we point at, we're seeing something different. We're seeing something new. We're seeing something we didn't know before. So what's going to happen is that if we can operate for 20, 25 years, we're going to find ourselves in a situation where people will take their observing programs, look at the data, and see the stuff that they didn't expect to see, and use that to bootstrap a follow-on observing program that will start to address stuff that was unknown the first time we took pictures of it. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, oh, oh a brave soul or a potty break. What's the Big Bang? What is the Big Bang? The Big Bang is the event that triggered the formation of the universe. So it's just where nothing became something. And they call it the Big Bang because all of a sudden the universe exploded like, like a like a big bomb, it exploded into being all of a sudden. Okay. Any other questions? I'll follow up that very good question that I'm glad you asked. Um, I want to know if that image that you showed at the beginning that looked like a glass turned on its side, and you talked about first light. 
I want to know if what you're finding now about the 300 year, sorry, 300 billion year um, timeline being different, yes, that. If, if now what's challenged about the Big Bang, uh, what happened after it, is going to throw into question the Big Bang theory in itself. It's probably not going to throw into turmoil the theory of the Big Bang itself. What it's doing is it raises the prospect of upending how fast stars formed and how fast galaxies formed. Um, after the Big Bang, you had this primordial soup of photons and electrons that were so thick and so dense that uh, no light could even form. So it wasn't until they uh, cooled down and they formed neutral hydrogen and they formed what they called the Dark Ages. And that lasted for approximately, according to the models, that lasted approximately 300 million years. And then there were disturbances and then the gaseous nitrogen uh, started to form and accrete and form into particles and enough coalesce to turn on the first stars. So when you see the fact that this timeline shows that the stars formed between 300 and 400 million light years or years ago and galaxies formed 100 million years after that, now all of a sudden Z13 is showing signs of it formed 300 million light years. It's not that the Big Bang theory itself is in trouble, it's how long it took stars to form after the development of the neutral hydrogen phase that's in development. The other possibility is that these, the Z13 was one of the earlier images, is that um, they're still in the process of what they call calibrating the instruments, calibration curves, fine tuning the instruments. So it might still be that uh, we have to finagle and finesse the observations a bit more. Uh, maybe there's some noise in the data that we didn't account for or that we thought wasn't there and it indeed was there. So it's introducing a, a signal that shows that it's older than maybe it is. So right now, yeah, there's a, uh, for the physicists or the chemists or the biologists, if you're familiar with the uh, Archive, which is that website with the preprints of papers that are peer-reviewed but not refereed yet. The Z13 finding was peer-reviewed. It's on the archive server, but it's not peer-reviewed. So they still need to resolve the data. But there's going to be other examples that I'm sure. I mean, originally there was claims of a, of a, of a galaxy with a Z of 20, which shows that that galaxy, if indeed it was at that distance, formed only 200 million light years after the Big Bang. That really can't be right. I mean, now you're starting to throw doubt on the laws of physics itself. So it's probably a case where you got to fine tune the age based on the models, you fine tune the age based on the calibration of the instrument itself. Is the Big Bang theory itself at risk? Probably not. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't lose sleep over that. Hello. Um, so, has the James Webb Space Telescope, I had to write this down, I was going to forget. <laughs> has the James Webb Space Teleco Telescope um, given any images or data that show the universe expanding faster than what Hubble had shown, or is it kind of like on par, or, yeah? The expansion rate of the universe itself is governed by what they call the Hubble constant. It's the value that determines uh, the rate of expansion in the universe. Uh, the actual value of the Hubble constant is something that's actually up to some, some debate. It varies between uh, value of 60 and 67, depending upon what paper you read. I think that what Webb may do is help hone in on refining the value of the Hubble telescope, which will give us a better feel for the true age of the universe. Is it 13.7 billion light years? Maybe it's 13.75 billion years. Maybe it's 13.8. Is it gonna show something wacky like 14, 15, 16 billion years? Probably not. It's gonna refine us beyond the 13.7, which is like the accepted value now. Thank you. We have about time for about one more question. And I don't know if I should be the last question. But Absolutely. 
what about extraterrestrial life? I know that might be a weird question, but there has to be maybe something out there. What do you think? Yes, I'm sure that there is something out there. <laughs> okay. Now, can Webb detect it? Perhaps. Now, follow me on this one. We know that there is a planet around the Alpha Centauri star system, among the closest stars to, to Earth, four and a half light years away. And it's the star system the Robinson family works going to and lost in space. But it's a trinary system. There's three stars in the system, one of which is Proxima Centauri. We know that there is a planet around Proxima Centauri. We know that that planet around Proxima Centauri is in what they call the habitable zone, that zone that is sufficiently far enough away from the star that the temperatures are conducive to the formation of life. Now, how sensitive is the Webb telescope if some of the later papers that came out pre-launch with regards to the calibration of the instruments are to be believed that if there is a civilization on Proxima Centauri and their approximately technical maturity to that of us, so like they have parking lots filled with sodium vapor lamps and everything like that, we would be able to detect them. We haven't looked at Alpha or Proxima Centauri yet, but yeah, we do have the ability to tease out details of planetary atmospheres that could be indicative of other forms of life. Are we gonna see aliens walking on another planet? Not with Webb, and not with that 15 meter monstrosity of 2045. But we can look and refine the habitable zone, and if something is close enough, we might be able to see indicators of, of life. Thank you. Whether it's intelligent or not is another thing entirely, but yes. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you for coming. I hope you all have a great evening. <laughs>